Welcome back to the Reloading Craft channel. Today we're going to be talking about seeding and crimping, the last and final stage in the load development process. In this video, we're going to cover how to set up a seeding die to both seat and crimp in the same step using a cast bullet, a helpful shortcut to set up your seeding and crimping die utilizing an already preset round, as well as how to set up separate seeding and roll crimping functions, which are commonly seen in revolver cartridges. This is going to be a fairly detailed video, so feel free to check the description down below for those timestamps so you can skip around to the sections which pertain directly to you. Thanks, and let's get into it. To begin, I've taken our seating die out of our die set here and just threaded it loosely into the top of the press. If you don't have a completed round to go off of, I'm going to walk you through the steps of how to get this die set up to do both the seating and the crimping functions. The seating function is simply going to push the projectile down into the case and the crimping function is going to slightly crimp the neck and remove any of the belling that we put in from the expander die. Note the crimping is not meant to squish from the mouth of this case into the projectile. That will ruin the coating for a non cantalord round. It is simply to remove the belling put on by the expander die. To begin, we're going to start off with a case that has been expanded but has no primer or no powder. This is going to make what we call a dummy round, which is simply for figuring out the die settings as well as the overall length. This will be in a completely inert round. I'm gonna start, I'll set the projectile to the side here, place that case in the shell holder, and raise it to the top of the stroke. Now, I'll begin to thread this die down until I feel resistance. This will let me know that the crimping portion of the die is starting to engage the mouth of the case. Right around there, I start to notice some resistance. So I'm going to thread that lock ring down temporarily and float this die stem up here on top. Next, I'm going to place a projectile in the top of that case and raise the ram once more. Now, threading it down, I feel contact right there. Throw this down a couple turns and you'll note it has started seating it into the case. Our target overall length here is 1.2 inches. Zero out our calipers. You can see we are currently at 1.394. So we have a significant ways to go. All I'm worried about at the moment is getting the overall length correct on this first round. One point two three nine, and we can see at this point that we are almost down past the curvature on the projectile itself. Another thing to check: it's based on mag length. You can see that round is plenty short for this magazine. Typically, the overall length given in the reloading manuals is going to be your to your minimum overall length, but it is all right to go a little bit longer than that in most cases. For this one, because that is so short, I'm gonna back that out a little bit and figure out what our true overall length should be. As long as we are at least 1.2 inches, we should be fine. We have two ways of checking to ensure that our rounds are going to feed reliably. The first, of course, is the magazine check. The second of which, is going to be the plunk test. If you haven't heard of the plunk test already, it is simply taking either a case gauge or the chamber out of your particular pistol. In this case, there's the barrel out of my P227. For the sake of demonstration, I'm gonna wipe the oil off of it. I'm not making a mess. And then we simply take this dummy round and drop it in. In this case, you can see it does not plunk or does not drop in all the way. We are meeting some form of resistance, most likely this bullet's catching rifling, and it will allow it to seat. On our too short seated one, that one goes in perfectly. And if you listen, I'll try to get this on camera, you can actually hear the plunking sound. When I drop it, it goes plunk and drops in. That's called the plunk test. The other option, of course, is to stick it and make sure it feeds in a magazine. My primary concern, however, is getting this one short enough to properly pass that plunk test. 
Back this down a little more. Getting closer, but not quite. You can also use a case gauge for this, which would also work just fine. Almost there. But I prefer to use the actual chamber because that's what's going to need to pass a reliability test. So we're now plunking. And that's what we're looking for. It should drop in freely and drop out freely. 1.2565. We are longer than the minimum length given, which is good. Write that down. 1.2565. And now we're going to set up the crimping step. To do this, I'm going to back out our seating stem pretty much most of the way. I'm going to back off that lock ring, place this completed round in, raise the ram. I'm going to start screwing this down. See right there I met some resistance. Go down a little more. And what that did was actually push this rim in against that projectile. I'm going to thread down the lock ring. That tightened the die in. That set our crimp adjustment. I'm going to raise that back up in. Thread down our seating stem. So that bottoms out, snug that up, and tighten down the lock nut for that. There we go. Set that to the side. I'll grab another empty case, set that in. Grab projectile, set that on top, line it up. And I'll put all of those steps together. See there, it nicely seated it. We don't have any shaving of the jacket. Or not the jack, but off the coating, off of the projectile, which is also what you want, and is nice and tightly pressed in against that case. When placing projectiles on top, two important things to remember. First, try to get them as square as you can. Basically, don't try to set it in something like that. When you go to seat that, it's going to shave the coating off. So try to get them as straight as you can. And second, with ones like this 45, they don't sit very deep in this loading block. Try not to knock these cases over as you set them on top. Other than that, Fairly simple process. And again, I'm checking each one of these as I lay these projectiles on top. This basically is my way of saying to myself, these are inspected, good to go, and I'm good to seat these bolts. This is one part where if you had someone helping you to reload or you're reloading with a friend, that one of you could be working on priming and expanding the next batch of cases while you set these on top. There's a lot of ways to divvy that up. Having a second person, especially when you're reloading single stage, does speed things up quite a bit. And with that, all of our projectiles are sitting on top. We are ready for seating and crimping. Now that our projectiles are set on top of our cases, properly powder charged, primed, all ready to go, we are now ready to move on to the seating and crimping process. First, before we do this, you have to have something on hand to set your completed rounds into once they are seated and crimped. I like to use these MTM ammo boxes. They're only a couple bucks a piece. They come with a load label if you choose to use it, as well as quick little tags. If you're setting these in an ammo can sideways or something, you can quickly label them with what caliber projectile you're using in them. Let's set that to the side. Set this over here, and our loaded rounds will go into here as we see. First, take a loaded round here, and I have already dialed this die in. If you are doing this with a die that you're intending on seating and crimping in the same stage, I recommend a couple things. First, when you do your expanding stage, and I think I covered this in one of the previous videos, make sure to have adequate expansion. This may look like a lot, but that will ensure when you seat this projectile, especially with casts that are coated like this, that will ensure that you're not scraping any of this coating off. In an auto pistol cartridge like 45 or 9mm 380 ACP 32 
40 Smith and Wesson, 357 SIG, they all apply this way. The only purpose of the crimp is to remove this belling and flaring right here you see on the mouth of the case. It is not to push the mouth of this case into the projectile. Doing that will ruin the coating, cause leading in your barrel. So. Now, if for some reason you do have a previously loaded round that you've loaded and already set the overall length on, the crimp on, all that, there is an easy way to use this completed round as a cheater to set up your seating and crimping die without having to go through all those previous steps. Let's take a look at that. So first thing I'm gonna do is place that previously completed round. You can see here, let's set that in there. See here, if I pull out a case gauge, this is a shooter's box, three-step case gauge, drops in perfectly, drops out perfectly. It's exactly what we're looking for in a completed round. All this is set up. I've checked it in my magazines. I've checked it in my chamber. This round works. So we're going to go off of this. Like I said, first thing I'm going to do, stick that in the shell holder here. Make sure the die is just barely threaded in here and raise this up all the way as if you were loading. Obviously bottom that out. Now I'm going to back the seating plug up substantially. Most dies have some form of seating plug like this. This happens to be a Lee. And then I'm going to thread down the main die body. And in this case, we are seating and crimping in the same step because these are true full metal jacket projectiles. That is super easy to do. It, unless you have a, a multi-stage progressive press where you want to separate them, if you're doing it on single stage, it makes sense to just do them in the same step. We're going to thread that down there until I get a little bit of resistance. See there, it starts to touch. We're taking up the slack on the threads. I'm gonna lower the ram a tiny bit. Continue to gently set the die down. And then I'm just gonna thread this lock ring down here in the meantime. Double check our round, make sure we're not excessively crimping this for any reason, which we are not. Back that lock ring off slightly. I just want a little bit of pressure. That looks good right about there. Double check in our case gauge. We shouldn't have done anything to it other than take up the slack. Which looks good there. Just set that to the side. And basically what that did was set up the crimping portion of the die, which is adjusted by moving the die body up and down. So we set that. Gonna take my hex key. There. Don't drop it. And just gently tighten down that pin. Now with this style of lock ring, when you tighten it down like that, you'll note I cannot break that die loose. It took up the slot between the threads and effectively cammed this die against the top of the press. In order to be able to thread the die in and out and retain this setting, I'm just going to take a wrench. And if you note here, that set screw is right about in line between the L and the E on the Lee here. Just gonna gently crack this loose, like so. Slide that back, and then actually tighten down that set screw. So that'll retain our crimp setting, and then you can either finger tighten this or just give it a gentle snug with the wrench like that, and that part's set up. Now we're gonna go back to this round, place that in, use that up, and we shouldn't feel any kind of resistance there, just very light resistance rather. And now we're going to thread down our seating stem. Okay, I'm push down the handle. That just touched the top of the bullet. I'm gonna make sure it's snugged. And now that should be set up. I'm gonna grab our calipers here. Make sure they're zeroed. There we go. And we are looking at 1.1430. Technically, my overall length is set to 1.1425. It's within a half a thousandth. That's what I assume to be the tolerance of the calipers. So that's perfect. Now I'm going to set this one to the side. Grab a dummy case. I have expanded this. There's obviously no primer, no powder in this. Grab a projectile. We're going to use this to confirm the setup on the die. The projectile with proper expansion. So just seat lightly inside the case, and you can tell I have a lot less expansion here 
with this full metal jacket than I do with the cast ones. I don't have to worry about shaving the coating on this and the bullet will actually form that slightly. Basically just enough belling to get it started. Place that in. Run the ram. See it down here, if we look on the outside of the case, make sure it's focusing. We've basically taken out that excess belling. We'll check it in the case gauge. Drops in, drops out. Make sure that again. Do not clean out my case gauge. Yep. And one point one four seven zero. So this is a little bit long. Gonna run the seating stem down a tiny bit. Run the ram again. Check it again. 1.1425, that's right where we want it. Again, this is a dummy round. I'm gonna repeat that with one more dummy round here. Around the rim. Okay, 1.1400. So now we're shooting on both lengths, or both ends of that. I'm going to back this back out it's about split the difference and do it with one more. Again, same deal. One point one four one five. So we're thousands off. I'm going to assume that either in nose variance or in actual seating variance um, due to the press. We'll run with that. I'll check it as I actually start to load these and fine tune as necessary. But for the base of it, this seating and crimping die is now set up and we are good to go. And of course, after we've got that set up and dialed in and knowing that I'm going to be loading that exact same seating depth and crimping for a lot of future rounds, I'm gonna take my Milwaukee Inksol paint pen here and I'm just going to make a little witness mark up the side of the lock ring on the side of the die and up on the top of the die and the seating stem like so that way I can tell should anything loosen up in bulk production I'd be able to tell this paint will obviously come off you can use like a obviously a paint thinner um, an acetone brake clean carbon clean whatever will take it right off so far in the seating crimping process we have just looked at cartridges which utilize a taper crimp which is simply designed to take the belling that is on that case mouth and flatten it back out against the side of the projectile, but does not roll that edge over or create any kind of markings on the projectile itself. While I talk on the topic of seating and crimping, it is important to note that the taper crimp is not the only method of crimping out there, and that there is another method commonly seen in revolver cartridges, such as this 357 Magnum that we're loading here, as well as some rifle cartridges, specifically tube fed rifles, as well as dangerous game rifle applications. To set up, in this case, 357 Magnum, we need to first take a look at the projectile and what our goal is with that. I have here one of these Missouri Bullet Company 158 grain high tech coated lead projectiles here. And you will note that right where my nail is, there is a groove formed around the outside of the projectile. We are going to do what is known as a roll crimp and actually take the very edge of the case mouth and roll that into that groove. This does a couple functions. First, it just closes off the belling as a taper crimp would. But secondly, it is designed under the recoil and the inertia of firing the revolver. That crimp actually locks the projectile into the case, whereas it would otherwise, if my hands are the case here, under the inertia, it could actually start to push these or pull these bullets outward and could lock up a cylinder. So it's designed for both safety and kind of mechanical functionality in that way. Now, when we set up our seating die with the intent of roll crimping, it is important to note that the roll crimping is done in a separate step with a separate die, uh, rather than using the seating die to do both steps like we were in the previous clip. To do this, and I've already dialed this one in, you basically set up the seating die so that the only thing it's doing is pushing the projectile down into the case. 
Let's take a look at that here. I simply insert my case, make sure my projectile's relatively close to vertical, and seat that. If you take a look here, the groove, let me grab one of these. If I line those up there, you can see that groove is right aligned with the mouth of this case. When we form that roll crimp, it's going to press the very edge of that case down into that groove and lock that projectile in place. If we take a look at these three here, they're all lined up in such a way that they are ready to be crimped. This will be done with a separate step and a separate die. It is important to note that when you are roll crimping, you have a projectile designed to accommodate a roll crimp. If you were to do this with a regular flat-sided projectile here and try to roll that in, especially on a cast lead projectile like this, you're going to ruin the exterior coating on it and you're going to get a bunch of lead buildup in your barrel because of that. With a jacketed projectile, or I guess more susceptible to it would be a plated, you ruin the outer coating and your accuracy will suffer, the bullet coating will be coming apart in flight, all that kind of thing. So when you do this, make sure the projectile you're using is designed to accommodate a roll crimp. Simply back out the seating die here. And grab the crimp die. Now this is what Lee considers to be their factory crimp die. And what makes it a little bit different from other crimp dies is that it does two functions instead of one. Most crimp dies do that, or do just that. They crimp. This one here has a carbide ring in the base, which is basically there to post size any out of spec cases to ensure they're gonna chamber. I have slightly mixed feelings on this. While it does help catch mistakes, I, I feel like it's simply a band-aid in some regards in that those mistakes are a fault of the actual loading process and should be corrected further on or earlier on, but that's neither here nor there. To use this style of die, you wanna thread this in. And in this case, this one's already set up. You're going to raise your ramps, your shell holders all the way to the top. Thread the die down until it touches. Um, Lee says to set it up basically so that it is going over the entire outside of the case should there be a dent in it or something that you missed in sizing. Um, it will correct that so that this round will properly chamber. So you're gonna wanna thread it down until it touches, then a little bit more. I typically do like an eighth of a turn, maybe 16th of a turn, basically right there to get just a nice, very, very light cam over. And then that part's set up. Uh, if you're setting this up for the first time, simply take one of your completed rounds, or one of your seated rounds rather, set that in the shell holder and back the seating plug all the way out, raise that ram with the, the round in the shell holder and then just dial this down in until you feel resistance and then dial it a little bit, check it, and you'll be able to kind of walk it in to get the correct amount of crimp. This one should be set up and properly dialed in here. Very little force is actually needed here. And you can see there, I have a little bit of a glare from the sun. Let me try to block that. Might be hard to see. But ever so slightly, just put a roll on the mouth of that case into that cantaloupe groove here on the projectile, the actual crimping groove. We'll grab another one and you can see here, not crimped. And there's the crimp. Let me see if I can put that up against a dark background. show it a little better. And that's all there is to it. Obviously, if you are using the correct style of crimp for the correct round that you're loading, you won't have any issues. If you were to accidentally do a roll crimp on a semi-auto cartridge, you have a decent chance that because the cartridge in like a 9mm or 45 headspace is off the case mouth, that it would go too far in and you would get light primer strikes or failures to fire. Um, with something like this, if you did just a taper crimp, it might hold the bullet properly, but in a magnum like this, 
I wouldn't risk it and risk the bullet actually jumping forward from inertia and locking up your cylinder. So it's, it's really straightforward to do. It takes hardly no force at all. If you're doing this on a progressive press, uh, you don't even have the extra, the extra step here. And basically it's doing it in a row. It makes sense to do it. And that's all there is to roll crimp. After you've finished admiring your handiwork, there's one step that you don't forget in the reloading process, both for safety and for good record keeping. And that is both good record keeping as well as properly labeling this box so I know the exact load that's in there. For pistol loads, I prefer to use these Frankfurt Arsenal reloading labels as they are cheap, readily available and use the larger ones along with their times loaded and number of firings on case marks at the bottom for my rifle loads. So to start, these are super easy to fill in. You just start with caliber. In this case, we are running 357 Magnum, right there. Bullet weight, these are 158 grain. It's from Missouri Bullet Company. These are called the Action dash GLs. CT dash GL, that ought to work. Powder weight and brands. This is my load data. Use at your own risk and verify it with a reloading granule. We'll clarify that. I'm using 9.3 grains of accurate number seven. This is a light magnum load, that's what it's designed for. Primers are federal small pistol. Miscellaneous head stamps and cases, so I just do that. These cases have been loaded once before. Case length, I don't trim through seven mags, so I just cross that out. Overall length, 1.6015. And the date, seven. I believe today's 29th, 22. Let me take this. These kind of split in half. Peel the backs off, like so. And this is no longer an arms core load, this is my load. Stick our label on there, so now we know exactly what these are. After we do that, let's look to a new page in my reloading logbook here. I like to put in the date. What I did, 37 mag, load, and then over here, 8, action dash GL, over, we can verify back here to our charge, 9.3 grains, accurate number 7, federal small pistol, 1.6015, that's what that's set up for, and that looks good. And then I'll put a quantity here. There's 50 in this box. And then there's this box back here, which I have yet to do. There's going to be 100 in that box. So we loaded 150 today. And that's that. Eventually, I will go back through like the past month or so of data put in this hard copy load manual. This gets put into an Excel spreadsheet for future reference. And favorite loads get saved for quick load data access. Thanks as always for watching. If you enjoyed the content we put out here, Go ahead, hit the like button, click the subscribe button, and don't forget to click that little notification bell next to it so you don't miss any of our future videos. And as always, keep on reloading.